Okay, I'm with uh, Jason Reziger Jenny. He's uh, quite a prolific uh, author of Prometheus and Atlas, Prometheism, Iranian Leviathan, novel folklore, Faustian futurist, lovers of Sophia, and world state of emergency. I've been reading um, Prometheus and Atlas and a bit of uh, Prometheism here uh, for quite a while. And uh, I've gone through Prometheus and Atlas a couple of times. And basically it really, that is like a powerhouse of a book. It, it's, there are so many new ideas and concepts and vocabulary for me. And um, my personal interest is for some time actually is after having had a sort of spiritual awakening is how does somebody who's some kind of spiritual uh, consciousness come to terms with the scientific world? which seems to negate and deny the very existence of something, which much to my surprise, because I didn't believe in spirituality previously, but all of a sudden it became very real for me. And it's just very difficult on, on various levels to even talk about spirituality. Now, of course, in your book, uh, Prometheus and Atlas, you really get into some of these ideas in a very deep level. And I was really pleased that uh, in the first chapter, more or less, you kind of eviscerate or deconstruct science. Um, but then, you know, then later on in your book, you do the same thing to spirituality, which was funny. Um, and there's like political outputs from your book too. There's like for the for the present day, you know, in some ways, your book is kind of like a it's like a uh, it's like doing a psychedelic drug. You know, you start off. Uh, in an intellectual zone, you get plunged into the Renaissance and the medieval period. You go flying through Atlantis and come out in a realization of new ideas for the modern world. So it's really, it's a heck of a book. And the one thing, um, there's a bunch of things that are interesting about it. And I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit overprepared, but as you suggested, we should just focus on a couple of the key concepts, which, are really interesting. So the first thing I brought up there, uh, Jason, was the idea that um, it's difficult for a spiritual person, especially today with, or not even a spiritual person, just a health mind person to try and uh, speak against science, right? There's a, uh, it's just, it's got complete um, domination over the dialogue, the cultural dialogue. And, um, Many people think that's because science is true. It's because science is truth. But in your book, you point out that that may not be the case. In fact, it may be part of uh, power relationships, power relationships which our culture has established and we've come to accept. Does that sound about right? Yeah, so the first thing I'd wanna make clear, Scott, is that I'm definitely not anti-science. Uh, what I'm doing here in this book, in Prometheus and Atlas, and in fact, with the whole project of Prometheism, is that I'm leveling a scathing critique at scientism. Uh, I'm leveling a critique at the kind of mechanistic, reductionistic mentality that uh, actually constrains scientific discovery and technological innovation. So one of the core theses of Prometheus and Atlas is that technology is more fundamental uh, than science. That in fact, technology is not applied theoretical science, rather theoretical uh, science, scientific theories are model building enterprises that are ultimately serving the purpose of uh, technological innovation. And that the techno-scientific enterprise should be driven by the spirit of discovery and exploration. And so when we wind up hemmed in by dogmatic adherence to particular scientific paradigms, we're actually uh, doing a disservice to the spirit of science, which is a Promethean spirit. And so, so uh, you know, the first thing to clarify there is that this is not by any means an anti-science text. Heidegger, who I draw on significantly, has often been uh, mistaken for uh, an anti-science thinker by some of the more reductive analytic philosophers in the Anglosphere. And I think that's a bad mischaracterization of Heidegger. What Heidegger was after was a fundamental transformation of the sciences through this kind of phenomenological reorientation of philosophy. 
that you know he was engaged in, and we can you know say more about that as we go along. But certainly, Prometheus and Atlas is not an anti-science text. It's rather a book that's attempting to reclaim the spirituality that is intrinsic to the scientific enterprise, to basically deconstruct the dichotomy between science and spirituality that, uh, as you uh, could see very clearly when you were reading it, um, was duplicitously set up by people like Descartes and Kant, uh, who subverted the spirit of the Renaissance and you know, basically uh, drew us down into this world where we are suffering from a kind of schizophrenic um, dichotomy between a reductionistic materialistic science on the one hand and blind faith in antiquated religious institutions on the other. It's really interesting because you talk about <clears throat> a spirit of science and sometimes it's difficult is difficult, like in the common parlance, the spirit of science means like the, uh, the, um, the feeling, the vibe of science. But actually what you're talking about is, I think, because when I think of spirit, I'm thinking of literal spirits, um, like a spiritual entity kind of thing. And it seems to me that when you uh, talk about Prometheus, you're actually, and I think in your book you say this, that science is a literal, evocation of Prometheus. Is that, is that actually what you're saying? It's a literal evocation of the spirit of Prometheus, but I think you point out that it's a one-sided evocation. It's almost like the, 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 the side of Prometheus or of science that we see is actually the shadow aspect of it. Yeah, so that's quite uh, correct. Basically, and I'll try to put this as simply as possible up front. Um, basically, the point that I'm making is the following, that the paranormal, what's been studied by you know, parapsychologists and by ufologists and so forth on the fringes of uh, scientific research, the paranormal is a clue or a key to understanding the essence of technological science as a whole. Uh, that when you understand that paranormal phenomena are not supernatural, but that they are parts of the natural world that are being filtered out and pushed to the fringe by our prevailing scientific paradigm. You realize that this uh, mechanistic framework of modern science is actually a projection over nature. And it's also a projection in another sense insofar as whatever can be captured within the net of scientific rationality, which has a fundamentally mathematical nature, right? Also allows you to project forward from what you know to what's going to happen in the future. And this has to do with one of the quintessential aspects or attributes of Prometheus. Prometheus is the one who sees ahead. Uh, Prometheus comes from the word for forethought in Greek, Prometheia. Uh, it's a kind of anticipatory knowing. And so what we're doing in the modern scientific enterprise is we're actually casting a net over nature and uh, grasping phenomena in a way that allows for anticipation and projection and therefore control. And this is a, a uh, I basically describe it as a demonic force that's at work on the world transforming both nature in the sense of the environment and also human nature. So what is effectively what I'm getting at is that there's a kind of reversal that takes place when you focus on the margins of uh, modern scientific research and look at the types of phenomena studied by parapsychologists, telepathy, psychokinesis, and so forth. There's a kind of reversal that takes place where you realize once you get past uh, kind of naive metaphysical dualism, and you understand the world as a world of power, right? The way that Nietzsche did or the way that William James did, you realize that what's been pushed to the fringe is not supernatural. It's that the world as understood by modern science is itself a kind of conjury. It, it is a kind of uh, demonic power over nature that's making nature appear in a certain way so that it can be controlled more effectively. 
when you use when you use words when you use words like conjuring and demonic those to me are very specific words do you mean them like literally or are you using them like for me those are like from the world of of magic yeah. which to me is a very literal thing yeah um, i mean i mean it literally i mean that modern science is black magic and yeah, okay. it, it can be very empowering as long as we understand that it's what we're doing mm -hmm. where it becomes dangerous is when we undergo this dissociation uh of the Promethean spirit of modern science from ourselves, and it begins to control us, where we begin to be set up by increasingly autonomous systems of technical organization and the algorithmic organization of information, so that uh, throughout this whole framework of increasingly networked technologies, we wind up coming under the control of what appears to be an external and alien force. Right. So that there is, as it were, a kind of artificial intelligence that begins to arise and organize our lives without that AI being localized in any particular computer. It's a kind of pervasive artificial intelligence, except this intelligence is profoundly stupid because it's actually an alienated and abstracted aspect of ourselves. Right. And so we're in a, on a social scale. We're in a kind of dissociated state where the Promethean spirit of science has become a runaway Frankenstein's monster that's imperiling human life in all kinds of ways. And for the Promethean spirit of science to fulfill its potential, we have to be able to reintegrate this uh, power and to recognize it as emerging from our own collective unconscious so that we can then more consciously take control of it and uh, with discernment, with proper judgment, uh, be able to use it in ways that are empowering and that encourage human flourishing rather than in ways that imperil the total instrumentalization of human existence. There's a woman who, I can't remember her name, you'll remember her name. There was a woman maybe a hundred years ago who uh, lived in Tibet, became a Buddhist monk, and she was practicing some of the Tumo exercises and uh, evoked uh, some kind of a Gregor in her room, but found that she couldn't control it and it became a big problem and she was trying to get rid of this spiritual issue which was quite a small thing just she had created it in her bedroom um uh, but it became a big issue in a way what you're saying is in some ways science or science uh, in its present form has kind of become this kind of runaway spiritual force too is would you think do you think it's kind of like this kind of thing it's almost like uh, in the magical terminology it's like the more thoughts the more thoughts you put on some kind of imaginative idea, the more life it takes on, right? So I think maybe that's what's happening with the scientific side, but it's also getting physical um, reinforcement also. Yeah, you're talking about Alexandra David Neal, I believe, Magic and Mystery yes. in Tibet. And yes. she was, uh, you know, discussing the, um, basically, I mean, the Tibetans call them tulpas, uh, these oh. thought forms that uh, the Greeks referred to as egregores. And yes, um, I made clear in Prometheism that uh, what I meant by the spectral essence of technology in Prometheus and Atlas was effectively that Prometheus is an egregore working through modern uh, techno-scientific development and organization. And so it, it's not as if, you know, some, some naive people like who come across my work and don't really look into it or may have heard one or another thing I've said in an interview uh, might be under the false impression that I'm suggesting we should all like sit around and hold hands in a seance and evoke the egregore of Prometheus or something. No, no, no. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the egregore of Prometheus is loose in the world right now. <laughs> okay. It, it's yeah. not like uh, going to appear as a ghost that looks like, you know, I don't know, the statue at Rockefeller Center or something. All right. Yeah. But Prometheus is that increasingly autonomous, uh, emergent artificial intelligence at work in all these convergent advancements in technology, in all these technological advancements like genetic engineering, um, robotics, cybernetics, uh, virtual reality that are converging on a singularity. And what I mean by singularity is that they're converging on a, a point that's no longer one point on an upward sloping graph, it's a spike on that graph. In other words, it is a point past which we're incapable of extrapolating what further developments may take place 
because further development beyond that point exceeds the parameters of the human condition. It's a point where we under, it's like an evolutionary bottleneck past which we're no longer properly speaking human. Okay, and so Prometheus is an egregore that uh, is, uh, that can be experienced in terms of this emergent, apparently autonomous intelligence at work in various technical developments leading toward the singularity. And what I'm saying is that before this thing has its way with us, we need to recognize that we're the ones projecting it on the level of the collective unconscious. And the we there is somewhat specific to the West. But at this point, as I think Heidegger understood very well, it has encompassed the entire globe. Okay, so, so yes, it's true that, you know, by certain metrics, like, I don't know, GDP, or, you know, maybe all, within the very short order military budget and so forth, China is exceeding uh, the United States and the Western powers, okay? But China is already caught within this net of instrumentality that's been set up by Western civilization. Western civilization, the civilization that begins with the Prometheus of Aeschylus in the fifth century, sixth century BC, that world has already encompassed the entire earth. There's no escaping it, okay? So all the Chinese can do if they wind up in control of the world is have a deficient relationship to this specter because it's not their own and they don't understand it properly, okay? And so their kind of totalitarian state with its neo-Confucianist mentality is not gonna understand the way in which it's deficiently relating to this demonic Promethean force. Only people who have a deep relationship with the heritage from out of which this uh, archetypal force emerged are the same ones who can sort of um, not put the genie back in the bottle, but re-internalize this psychical force in a way that's going to be, again, beneficial to human existence rather than, uh, you know, face us with a prospect of dehumanization. I'm really interested in how we put the genie back in the bottle, if you will, but it seems like for several hundred years since Descartes, there's been a whole bunch of people, basically it looks like out of fear, out of fear, trying to, trying to hide from or trying to obfuscate the, this, the spiritual aspect of what Prometheus is, thereby allowing us to experience the, the, uh, the shadow aspect. Now, would you, would you say that the, um, now in your book, you talk about Descartes and Immanuel Kant, and it's astonishing. I was like astonished reading what you were saying there uh, about those guys. Um, but it seems like they kind of started like a cascade of, uh, maybe they didn't start it, but it was like, there's like a cascade of, um, of obfuscation. Um, and, and specifically in the case of uh, Immanuel Kant, it seems like it was almost out of fear um about this sort of this sort of like this uh the spiritual aspect of all objects um do you think that's i guess what where i'm trying to go with this is i'm trying to ask about the um about uh how the how this information is tied up in power relationships i'm trying to go to Foucault here like how is our discourse completely tied up so it becomes difficult to say anything about it like there's a meme on Facebook right now that uh, the only thing that's better, uh, which can disprove science is better science. You can't say anything. Um, so how those power relationships which tie up the discourse, how deep are they? Or maybe I'm completely wrong about my characterization of this. Yeah, so I, the way you approach the question, I think we should start with Descartes and then work our way to Foucault. Um, okay. <laughs> because, all right, and I'll try to make a, a very long story short. Again, this is covered uh, at length and in depth in a couple of chapters of my book. I mean, the ones on Descartes and Kant, and then there's a whole opening chapter on um, Foucault and other thinkers of deconstruction. But basically what happened is this. Uh, I, I would say that the fears on the part of people like Kant and Descartes were to some extent justified for the following reason. Um, you had a situation after the dark ages that were precipitated by, you know, the, the destruction of Alexandria and the other great centers of knowledge of the classical world by the church, right? After this, this dark ages, 
uh, caused by the church's destruction of the high culture of classical antiquity, you had in the Renaissance, backed by people like the Medicis, backed by people like uh, the royal family of France, a resurgence of pagan science. I mean, it's fair to call it that, okay? Um, of basically a scientific worldview which drew no distinction between the spiritual and the natural. So, you know, you have a lot of like hylozoism in that period and understanding that that uh, things in nature have spirit and that, you know, there's no, there, there isn't this dichotomy that as we're gonna see Descartes sets up between mind and matter. And so when Giordano Bruno is putting forward this new scientific vision of the world, which by the way, included heliocentrism and included the idea that, you know, uh, actually he was more than a heliocentrist. He thought that there was no center of the universe and that all the other suns were, were also, you know, uh, stars that had planets revolving around them and that the universe was full of extraterrestrial intelligence and so on and so forth. But the important point is this, that when Bruno was putting forth this new scientific worldview uh, that represented a resurrection of Pythagorean, you know, um, classical science, there was no distinction between the spiritual and the natural, which meant that the soul was an object of scientific knowledge, right? So the things that religion makes claims about, like life after death, the origin of the soul, the nature of you know, uh, disembodied existence and so on and so forth become then objects of scientific knowledge. Well, this represents a fundamental threat to the church, obviously, right? Which is why we had all these witch burnings and the witch burnings weren't just burn, you know, uh, persecutions of, I don't know, bumpkin you know, peasants, right? In the countryside who suffered you know, enough, but it was also a burning of sorcerers on the level of Giordano Bruno, men of knowledge, men of science. And so what happened in the generation of Rene Descartes and then going into you know, the, the, uh, the zenith of the enlightenment and figures like Immanuel Kant is an attempt to develop a kind of science that would leave questions of the soul in the domain of faith, right? So, and, and this wasn't simply uh, something that was done subconsciously or out of subconscious fear of what would happen if men of science were to explore questions about the soul or you know, other uh, issues that fall within the domain of religious faith. It was actually quite a deliberate project forwarded by the church. I argue in my chapter on Descartes that if you look at the biography of Rene Descartes, you see that the man was actually an agent of the Jesuits yeah. and that he was, he was tasked by the Holy Inquisition. His personal publicist was one of the hammers of the Holy Inquisition. Rene Descartes was tasked by the Holy Inquisition to come up with a scientific methodology that he knew was false, okay? Because when you read the journals of Rene Descartes, which survived through Leibniz's quotations of them, you see that Descartes personally had, you know, a plethora of paranormal experiences. In fact, they shook him to his core. And so Descartes knew that these things were real, but he was tasked by the Jesuits to develop a materialistic mechanistic science and a completely abstract uh, non-material mind, right? That, um, that cannot give any account of uh, the soul as a personality or the interactions of the soul with the physical world. In other words, Descartes' unextended mental substance is defined precisely in a way that it would preclude phenomena like telekinesis or telepathy or any of the things that the church associated with uh, black magic and conjury and so forth, right? So Descartes sets up this dualism between a completely empty uh, abstract mind and a matter that's reducible to um, elementary particles and uh, elementary particles that can be mathematically measured and anticipated in terms of this Cartesian grid that he throws over the cosmos. I mean, Cartesian, Cartesius, Latin name of Descartes, we get the whole Cartesian grid system from him. And so the purpose of that was to make it so that uh, 
people would be so demoralized by this materialistic, mechanistic model of the universe that they would continue to give their hearts to the church. That when it came to anything important, when it came to a basis for ethics or how to organize society, people would continue to invest in the authority of the church. And we saw exactly this happen in the French Revolution where people who took the materialism of Descartes and just got rid of this unextended mental substance, which was effectively worthless conception of mind, people like Julien Offray de la Maitrie, Baron Holbach, who, who took on the materialism of Descartes and developed it into the groundwork for modern science, right? Just jettisoning his notions of the mind, those people ultimately developed a completely soulless model of nature, which was utterly incapable of providing a, a uh, paradigm for governing society. So during the French Revolution, the first year or so, the cult of reason who took over the French state were basically followers of this materialist adaptation of Descartes. And uh, you know, the, the, the society came to the conclusion that um, order would break down entirely if these people were left in charge, these atheistic materialists. And so then you had a reaction by Robespierre and the cult of uh, the Supreme Being, which was a totally artificial attempt to you know, create a kind of civic religion. But then ultimately in this you know, machinery of death that was the French Revolution, the soulless materialism of the cult of reason led right into Napoleon Bonaparte's restoration of the power of the Catholic Church, okay? And my argument in Prometheus and Atlas is that this was by design. Descartes was basically hired to do this. It was his mission as a Catholic stormtrooper. Um, and then, you know, we can go on and, and talk about how Kant furthers this project as well. But let me, uh, let me get your reflections on that before That's, we go. It's, it's unbelievable, really. Um, and uh, Descartes, in a way, is perfectly, it was a couple of things. One, by doing this whole project, he's kind of removed the soul from the object, right? So, he's, so now you have to go to an organization to connect. Uh, and he's also done this separation, which probably is working. I think the, it sounds to me like the project was actually to separate it sort of uh, in humans, but it's actually, the, it's, it's seen maybe what's happened, is it's happened with all objects. So I think I saw in one of your posts somewhere that you believe, and I believe the same thing, that all objects have an, are inherent, uh, inherently have consciousness or they have some kind of soul aspect of them. And so in this project, I think what's happened maybe as a tertiary effect is it separated it completely through all objects. So what we're left with is a completely mechanistic idea. Now in your book, you point out that um, there's a there's a phrase which is this this phrase of clockwork, and how in fact you were mentioning that Descartes, which is it's ironic because like everybody's heard like it was one of the first things I heard in college was oh I think therefore I am, it's the the hallmark of the Enlightenment. But actually, as you point out, he was a deeply spiritual guy. He had night terrors. He was uh, he went to some uh, so I don't know. It wasn't like some kind of like health spa to try and recuperate his mental his mental health he seemed to have like quite a few issues and this is the guy in charge i mean in a way he's the perfect guy to know which aspects to separate because he's actually confronted them it's unbelievable this is just reading these chapters in your book which are some of the initial chapters it's just astonishing it really is um unbelievable now the other one is you're pointing out going into going into emmanuel kant um, I did some reading like maybe eight or nine years ago on Swedenborg because I was having all these spiritual experiences myself and trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And so I couldn't believe it. You start talking about Swedenborg and Immanuel Kant also seems to have us, he, he seems to go through a process where he also writes a leaflet or a book where he also tries to kind of mock the uh, spiritual aspirations of Swedenborg. But at the same time, much like uh, Descartes, he's also having spiritual experiences, but probably with some kind of different motivation, I guess. He wasn't a Jesuit. Yeah, I don't know um, how many spiritual experiences he had, uh, but the thing about his uh, pamphlet on, it's more than a pamphlet, it's really a book that he wrote, a short book that he wrote um, on Swedenborg, is that although the tone is mocking, if you really read it carefully, you see that the content 
actually uh, amounts to a endorsement and legitimation of Swedenborg's uh, spiritualism on some level, right? So the, the tone of this work, Dreams of a Spirit Seer, conflicts with its content. And the thing about Kant is that, um, going back to Descartes, he looked at this model that Descartes had set up of the unextended mind and extended material substance, and he saw that there was a fundamental problem with it insofar as the modes of these two different substances, which define them as distinct, ought to be mutually exclusive of each other, right? So that like size, shape, and extension are the modes of material substance. And then, you know, like memory um, and uh, intuition and thought and so forth are modes of mental substance. These two uh, substances are supposed to be totally distinct as defined by their respective modes, but Descartes had linked them up through the pineal gland in the brain because Descartes couldn't provide an adequate account of how it is that the mental substance moves anything physical. In other words, when I will myself to you know, raise up my hand, how is it that my mental substance is interacting with the machinery of this body, right? And Descartes had a really lame answer to that because of course Descartes' whole project was a con job to begin with, right? So it, it wasn't really about developing an effective system. So he had this lame answer to that, that somehow the mental substance interacts with the body through the pineal gland and the brain. And Kant understood, as anyone with half a, half a brain really should, that it, it matters very little whether you're claiming that the mental substance can move the pineal gland or whether you know, the mental substance can lift the table off the ground, right? If mind has power over matter, it has power over matter, which means that psychokinesis is possible or what they used to call telekinesis. And Kant thinks that this is extremely dangerous. So one thing you see in his writings on Swedenborg, which are from his youth, is that the guy sat down, he read all 12 volumes of Swedenborg's Secrets of the Heavens, Arcana Colestia. Imagine the investment of time. You think a person who doesn't take paranormal phenomena seriously is gonna sit there and read like all 12 volumes of... And so in this study, it's very clear that Kant is terrified of the possibility of people developing these occult abilities and using them in ways that are unethical, right? So he wants to, uh, you know, the, the lesson from his study of Swedenborg is that he wants to find a way to set up a system of knowledge that would preclude these as possible experiences. So he basically says, okay, Descartes' dualism is incoherent. What I'm gonna do is take all of the laws that we think are laws of nature, that we think are laws that govern what Descartes uh, framed as material substance, and I'm gonna make them the laws of consciousness. So they become the laws, the necessary ways in which our cognitive faculty has to organize our perceptions, right? So if telepathy or telekinesis or clairvoyance, there's a lot about clairvoyance in Kant's study of Swedenborg because Swedenborg was a powerful clairvoyant. If these phenomena violate laws of nature, okay, supposedly, then if you make the laws of nature actually laws of how our cognitive structure has to necessarily function and organize information, you make these types of things impossible experiences. That's what Kant does with how he sets up his system of knowledge that becomes so, paradigmatic so for the enlightenment. He's kind of relocating the information just to make it sort of unusable? He's, he's taking what Descartes described as laws of the natural world. Yeah. And what all the materialists after Descartes described as laws of the natural world. And he's saying, no, no, no. We don't know anything about the world in itself. We don't know anything about things in themselves. We only know how our cognitive structure has to organize our perceptions. Yeah. And what we call laws of nature are really a description of the ways in which our own minds have to organize nature, right? So okay. a, an act of telekinesis is an impossible experience. You must be delusional if you think that you've witnessed yeah. such a thing, let alone that you've carried out such a thing, because it violates the very manner in which we're, uh, we're capable of perceiving the world since the laws of nature that these phenomena supposedly violate are actually laws of our own consciousness, okay? Now, here's the thing, is that Kant knew this was false. 
because he read Swedenborg in depth and he believed that Swedenborg and other psychics were capable of doing things like this. And moreover, some of the basic structures that Kant uses to develop his own framework of knowledge are basically lifted from out of Swedenborg and made a little bit more conceptually sophisticated. Okay, so if you, you, you take dreams of a spirit seer and you put it next to the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, where Kant develops his ethics, you'll see how Kant took ideas in Swedenborg and basically souped them up in a slightly more uh, uh, conceptual abstract way and made them the bedrock of his own uh, framework, okay? And he did it while denying the kinds of experiences that Swedenborg used in order to develop those ideas. So it's extremely duplicitous. And, and again, what is the upshot of this? The upshot of this is to say that since we can't know anything about the way the world is in itself, we can only have faith in how things actually are, including what our soul actually is and what its relationship to God may be, right? So again, he's saving faith because he thinks that it's necessary for ethics. Okay, yeah. so both Descartes and Kant uh, coming after the era of the burning of witches and sorcerers, right? The burning of, of Renaissance men of science who wanted a science that was holistic, where there was no division between the spiritual and the natural. Coming after that traumatic era of witch burnings, men like Descartes and Kant developed a soulless, mechanistic, materialistic paradigm, even if it, you know, they call Kant an idealist, but it's nonsense. His idealism might as well be materialism. He's just taking the materialistic, mechanistic laws of nature and saying they're laws of our own consciousness. These men did that in order to save the biblical religion and the institution of the church and so forth. And yet they're held up as paragons of enlightenment. Uh, it's really a, a perverse rewriting of history. It's really interesting. Um, no. Since we're talking about people who've kind of obfuscated, um, obfuscated the spiritual aspects, uh, and I don't know if he really did this, but in your book, it's much later in your book, you mentioned somebody else, you mentioned Sigmund Freud, and how also he also had, uh, um, well, I don't, I don't know if he actually hit it. It sounds more like he came to understand that this spiritual aspect was the key to psychoanalysis, but all of his peers we're trying to shut them up so nobody could could grasp on to this thing. So it seems like this 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 uh, the spiritual aspect of uh, of all things is like an enduring concept, which for the last five hundred years or so people have been trying to forget. Is that, uh, so? Can you talk a little yeah, bit? About yeah, yeah. No, what, what, this takes it even was? deeper, right? Um, Sigmund Freud came to the conclusion that telepathy, clairvoyance, uh, and other psychic phenomena were the key to understanding the id and the unconscious. In the, the 1920s, he wrote a series of presentations, um, including one that was supposed to be given for the International Association of uh, you know, uh, Psychotherapy. And um, he wrote a series of these presentations, telepathy and occultism, telepathy and dreams, uh, telepathy and psychoanalysis, a series of lectures like this, right? Uh, and these lectures that he wrote were based on seances that he himself held with his daughter and with a collaborator, Sandor Ferenczi. Wow. And it turned out that in these seances in the 1920s, Freud discovered that he himself was an adept medium. The guy had exceptional abilities as a medium himself. <laughs> and so he writes all these lectures and he intends to come, come forward and publicly uh, declare that psychic phenomena are the key to understanding the uh, unconscious. And this guy, Ernst Jones, who was a British neurologist and basically uh, positioned himself as Freud's handler prevented Freud from doing this. And at, at one point, Freud actually did make a public statement, but then Jones made him recant it um, and, and basically uh, lie and say that, you know, Freud's interest in uh, telepathy and the occult 
is a personal affair. It's basically an eccentricity like the fact that he's a smoker and the fact that he's a Jew. And, and so Freud came out and he, you know, he, he basically made this pathetic apology uh, and attempted to cover up how central he believed the occult was to psychoanalysis and to the understanding of the unconscious. So what I argue in uh, Prometheus and Atlas at the very beginning with respect to Freud is that unlike the Copernican revolution, which was carried through and represented a significant paradigm shift in the history of science, and unlike the Darwinian revolution, which was another you know, uh, full scale paradigm shift, the successful shift in the epistemic structure of the sciences, the psychical revolution remains uncompleted. And that what Freud was embarking upon with his notions of the id and the unconscious and transference and so on and so forth is actually an uncompleted scientific revolution. And it's uncompleted because its implications are absolutely terrifying. If you really understand the unconscious and its relationship to consciousness, right? The relationship between the subliminal and the conscious ego between the id and the ego, if you understand these things in terms of telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, you run the risk of a total breakdown of social order. Here's why. In the decades since Freud, we've had, oh, at this point, I mean, many tens, if not hundreds of parapsychological studies in some very well, uh, funded prestigious laboratories like Princeton uh, University's Engineering and Anomalies Research Program, the work that J.B. Ryan did back at Duke University. Tens of laboratories have studied telepathy and psychokinesis and so forth and determined that these are processes of the unconscious. Okay, so it's very hard to control psychokinesis. A lot of people are capable of psychokinesis. It's not like there are just these adepts who can bend spoons and so forth. Psychokinesis, it turns out, it takes place all the time, but we don't realize that we're responsible for it because it's happening on an unconscious level. Sure. Now, and, and also telepathy happens on an unconscious level. People will get signals from other people. The in information will be transferred as Freud noticed that it was in psychotherapy sessions. Information will be transferred between people without a person realizing that the images they're getting or the notions that are forming in their mind are actually coming from somebody else's mind, right? Uh, subconsciously, without that person willing the information transfer. So this is profoundly unsettling because if we were to recognize that we are routinely uh, engaged in psychokinesis, we would have to become responsible for our intentions lest they wind up having a harmful effect on others, right? I mean, if you take psychokinesis seriously as Kant did, despite his uh, duplicitous you know, uh, uh, claims to the contrary, right? If you take psychokinesis as seriously as Kant did in Dreams of a Spirit Seer, you realize that it's really possible to harm someone with your thoughts. I mean, if you wish somebody dead, you know, you could actually give that person a heart attack there have been, or a stroke, there have been many uh, parapsychological studies on what they call distant healing or, you know, um, telepathic healing or whatever, where, you know, people attempt through visualization to uh, have a positive effect on, you know, cancerous tumors and so forth, right? By the same token, you can interfere with someone's vital organs and, and vital functions in a way that harms, if not kills them. Okay. I think you pointed out maybe in one of your other chats that uh, there was a program of remote viewing done where they were trying to kill world leaders at one point. So certain remote viewers were trying to take out Saddam Hussein and various things like this. I think it was you. Soviet about Union it. was doing that. The Soviet Union would take mice and, and, and other animals down into submarines and try to stop their heartbeats. And when the United States found out that the Soviets were doing this, they came to some of the remote viewers who were working for the CIA in the program that was started by the Stanford Research Institute funded by the CIA. They came to some of these remote viewers and asked them to do similar things to targets like Saddam Hussein. And a anyway, long story, they, some of them were very wary of it. And I think ultimately what happened is that they opened up a deeper black project where they did these things 
without any congressional oversight whatsoever. Be that as it may, my point is this, that with respect to Freud and you know, why the psychical revolution uh, remains uncompleted, unlike the Copernican and Darwinian revolutions, if you realize that you know, your mind subconsciously has an effect on the world, including on other people, and whether or not they might wind up dead because you wish them ill, right? You're gonna have to be a much more integrated person than most people are. You have to have control over your thoughts and your intentions. And who wants to live in a society like that? Also, as Freud realized in his psychotherapy sessions, you can't control what information you might volunteer to somebody. If, if we really are capable of telepathy, and if it's a trainable ability, so that everybody has some level of ability, but that if you go and discipline yourself like a martial artist does, you can actually enhance your telepathic ability, we wind up in a society where people can be inside each other's minds or where your neighbor, you know, or, or someone halfway across the world can be surveilling your most intimate thoughts, okay? And so there is a, possib there is a possibility that there would be a breakdown between, uh, a breakdown of the barrier between the subconscious or the unconscious and the conscious mind, a breakdown between the id, which we repress and suppress and remain deliberately unconscious of, right? a breakdown of, of the barrier between the id and the ego. And this is really dangerous. I mean, this is the idea that was explored in that uh, great sci-fi film from the 1950s, Forbidden Planet. And this is why Freud's associates, at least, did not let him go through with uh, making public the centrality of um, the occult to psychoanalysis and the study of the unconscious. And it's ultimately why uh, as you suggested at the outset, um, what we're dealing with here is really an issue of power and its inextricability from systems of knowledge. That systems of knowledge, as, as Michel Foucault suggests, systems of knowledge are actually power structures. It's not as if there's some objectively existent reality that our scientific theories more or less adequately mirror, right? We're not reaching with our scientific theories toward objectively existent objects in nature that we can more or less adequately grasp. Rather, our uh, scientific theories are actually products of certain power relations. And so if it is to the detriment of the existing institutions and power structures to have telepathy and psychokinesis and so forth be trainable on a large scale, then those phenomena are going to be pushed to the margins. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, neglected and, and suppressed because they are threatening to the uh, extant power structure, not because you know, they aren't actually phenomena in nature. Now, I can see how that would be uh, scary, the various groups and power structures. Um, but I wonder, you know, it's like, it seems to me like you're talking about these abilities like telekinesis and um, clairvoyance, um, and all of the other ones, clear audience, whatever they are, and um, that to me, and this is just this is just my point of view because I've experienced some of those things. Is that uh, it seems to me those are actually competing competing technologies. Like it almost seems to me like science as we know it today is like the exteriorization of uh, it's almost like the projection of interior abilities to the outside world and um and it's it's and that's what it is but if for example you can you, you can you can have clear audience or clairvoyance you're certainly not going to need your iphone or your cell phone or whatever right uh the, the 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 implications of these powers internalized inside of humanity seems to me like it challenges science completely now but I'm not sure. It seems to me like what you're saying is Prometheus actually represents both aspects. He it's the technology of science and it's the technology of the interior human it's the interior human technology too. It's just exactly. a wonderful thing. So Prometheus brings techne to yeah. man. The fire is the fire of the light of science and the fire of the forge of technology. Techne uh, is the gift that Prometheus brings to man for the sake of human empowerment and so that we don't wind up continuing to have this servile relationship to the gods so that we don't have these Olympian overlords and we can be self-determining, right? 
But this techne, in its original Greek meaning, signifies both technology in the sense of, you know, the technology that the scientific enterprise is engaged in developing and also art. Art and craft is also techne. Techne means craft in Greek in a sense that precedes this dichotomy between technology and art. Okay, so uh, psychical ability is a techne, just as you were saying, and it doesn't have to be one to the exclusion of the other. I give an account in Prometheus and Atlas in the chapters where I'm, I'm comparing Heidegger with Henri Bergson. I give an account of how as we developed our instrumental capacities and started to engage more effectively with the manipulation of the natural world and with uh, various projects of construction, right? Um, as we developed a more mathematical mindset and we became more technically capable in manipulating the environment, our psychical abilities atrophied. So these abilities like clairvoyance, telepathy and so forth are stronger in animals. There've been many studies that show that, you know, animals are incredibly telepathic. They're far more telepathic than humans. And they also use clairvoyance. If, if a dog gets lost on the other side of the country, right? It can, let's say, you know, people from uh, New York are vacationing in California, they lose their dog there. It's entirely possible for that dog to use clairvoyance to wind up right back at the doorstep of their owner in you know, uh, Long Island. That's happened, it's happened many times. That's an exercise of clairvoyance on the part of dogs. And you know, there's numerous stories of, of uh, animals uh, having precognitive uh, uh, presentiments of earthquakes and other natural disasters and so forth. So they're far more psychic than we are. And what happened is that as we developed our technical intellect, these abilities atrophied in us, okay? Because we didn't need to use them as much anymore. So you're right, there's a kind of inverse relationship, but that doesn't mean that we should give up all of our material technologies in favor of re redeveloping these psychic abilities. That would be tacitly deferring to materialism for the following reason, think about it. If you see material, quote unquote, material technologies as entirely negative, as if they're somehow alienating us from our spiritual nature, right? You're still working with this, this dichotomy of the spiritual and the material, which is a false dichotomy. The right thing to do is to think about material, putatively material technologies as something like sigils or talismans. The blueprints of technological devices are not fundamentally different in nature from mandalas and talismans and sigils. They're just very sophisticated talismanic devices which work <laughs> because they organize perception in a certain way. You, yeah. you get what I'm, where I'm going with that? And so yep. it's entirely possible to develop a civilization where we uh, resuscitate these atrophied psychic abilities and intertwine them seamlessly with putatively material technologies where we have like telepathy that's enhanced by certain computer systems, by certain information processing, where you know there, there's a cybernetic uh, mediation of clairvoyance that allows us to not just see distant locations in our minds, but to record our perceptions in detail and actually use clairvoyance for, uh, I don't know, surveying distant sites the way we would use a satellite, right? So- One of, one of the things I like possible. about one of the things I like about um, about your book and some of your ideas is that you uh, you actively engage because uh, I mean in your book it's interesting because you you engage with historical references and philosophical references at a very deep level but you're quite capable of moving over to fiction and science fiction specifically I th and you, I think at one point in your book you mentioned that uh, that science fiction should be the leap motive of uh, or of the imagination or something like that. And it's almost like what you're saying, it's, it's, it's got a very, it's almost like what you're trying to do is, is grasp the, the absolute positive aspects of both worlds and combine them into the most positive aspect. In a way, it's kind of like what Elon Musk is trying to do, I think with his, with his brain implant. His, his whole idea behind that is that, well, it's gonna happen anyway. It might as well be done with like, with goodwill, I guess. Um, 
I'm pretty skeptical about, I mean, I, I'm skeptical just because, you know, you, you're dealing, you're dealing with people who, uh, like the, um, the integrity of science, for example, it's almost an oxymoron to be able to trust. And so I, I wonder about how this is integrated and specifically, uh, bringing this back to Prometheus is, uh, like you were saying earlier, and you said this in your book, that you're not suggesting that we all sit around holding hands, evoking Prometheus, right? So I'm in, I'm interested, like, if that's not what you're doing, if you're not going to literally evoke Prometheus, which, um, then then how do you do it? What, what is the way to do it, to, to try and do this sort of integration? Because as you mentioned, there's this singularity, which you've pointed out could be in 30 years, this uh, convergence of technology and artificial intelligence. And so in that time, with this overwhelming momentum of the shadow aspect of Prometheus barreling down the highway, um, how, do we, uh, how do we harness that? Yeah, so what, what we need to do is to uh, understand techne in its essence again, right? So um, Prometheus, is the bringer of techne as a, as a gift to mankind. And there are certain fundamental characteristics of Prometheus that can act as an ethical framework for how to navigate the perils of the technological singularity. So to begin with, we need a society where children are not educated into scientific materialism, right? And we need a society where people are being brainwashed by these revealed religious belief systems but we also need a positive ethical and spiritual uh, uh, um, constitution to be not uh, arbitrarily set forth by fiat, but to be discerned from out of the essence of technological science itself, right? So uh, Prometheus is a, an enlightener god, right? Prometheus is someone who's bringing the light of science and the power of technology for the sake of enlightening humanity and liberating humanity. And Prometheus is also a god or rather a titan who sacrifices himself to a, to a torment worse than death, right? Uh, in order to empower humanity and liberate us from these capricious tyrants that are the Olympian gods. So there's a dimension of altruistic enlightenment there is a dimension of self-sacrifice that's involved in the Promethean ethos. There's a rebellion against tyranny that's intrinsic to the Promethean ethos. There's a spirit of uh, exploration and discovery that is intrinsic to the Promethean ethos. And this you see very clearly in the way that uh, Shelley develops the idea of Prometheus in um, uh, the modern Prometheus or Frankenstein the spirit of exploration and discovery as intrinsic to the Promethean. So what I'm suggesting is that there are, there are all these facets of the Prometheus archetype or egregore that constitute an ethos. And we need to internalize and embrace this ethos so that we can use it as a way to navigate the dangers of the technological singularity with discernment. And this ethos has to be global in scope because the danger that's posed to humanity is global in scope, right? So this is a tall order. We need to defeat scientific materialism. We need to defeat the revealed religious institutions, which represent the Olympian tyrannical forces still uh, captivating us. And then we need to embrace a Promethean ethos that becomes the ethical framework, the ethical, that sets the ethical parameters for dealing with technologies like genetic engineering, cybernetics, you know, artificial intelligence and so forth. And uh, that would be what it would mean to recapture the positive aspect of Prometheus and uh, rein in this, you know, shadow side of the Promethean egregore that's right now mindlessly running amok in the world. I think um, it seems to me that Possibly one way of doing this is um, obviously uh, Prometheus and Atlas, your book, is it's kind of like an exposition on the on the problem, like historically and philosophically. So it's got a particular audience. But the 
the you know that's a complex book to read it's complex there's a whole lot of uh, really interesting stuff in it but what we're talking about here is like change on a on a global level and um and it seems to me that it, the ideas need need to be encapsulated somehow in, a, in some kind of like simple form, maybe artistically. I don't know. And so, have you thought about ways that that how can it be simplified? I was thinking you should write you should write a children's book. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, one of the the differences between this book and this one is that this one is already an attempt to simplify the ideas. I don't know if you noticed that from looking at them, but. Prometheism is a much more action-oriented and elemental presentation of the project of Prometheus and Atlas. So I'm already going in that direction. And then the next book after Prometheism was a novel, which I hope will be adapted to a film. So I, I entirely agree with you that yeah. you know, these ideas need to be popularized and they need to be translated into an elemental form that reaches the subconscious mind directly. Yeah. So, you know, that's... It's indispensable. And that's something that I can do, but it's also something other people should do. I mean, you know, I'm a philosopher. And so my primary task is to express these ideas in their full complexity and, and with their, you know, uh, total integrity, right? I, I need to present this uh, vision in the most conceptually robust and coherent and uh, integral fashion. Many other people who work in various arts um, and you know, mediums of communication can take these ideas and can translate them in all kinds of ways that make them more accessible and uh, that, that allow for a mass dissemination of them. Now, I have to say as a caveat to that, that, and I don't know how you know, disappointing you may find this statement, um, <laughs> but, I have to say as a caveat to that, that I don't think it's going to be possible to reach the majority of people in society. I just don't think it's possible. I am very upfront in my books, uh, especially in Prometheism, that we really are facing an evolutionary bottleneck. And, you know, the wheat is really going to be separated from the chaff here. We are headed toward a moment where humanity has to take an evolutionary leap. And what I'm trying to do is to make sure that rather than going extinct through either like literal extinction or through a dehumanization where what's on the other side of it is not even recognizably human, we use this technological singularity as an opportunity for an evolution beyond mere humanity in a positive sense. So that we wind up becoming superhuman rather than inhuman or dehumanized, right? But as in all cases of evolution, evolution involves extinction. Evolution involves the selection for of a certain mutation and the selection against those who do not adapt in response to environmental pressures. And so I think there's going to be a major selection against that takes place over the next several decades, certainly within the 21st century. And so uh, as much as it's important to popularize the ideas of Prometheism and the project that began with Prometheus and Atlas, there are going to be limits. It's only going to appeal to a certain subset of the population. Uh, but the, that subset of the population are, as it were, the mutants who represent uh, the inception of a, you know, superhuman species that I think is our rightful destiny. I would say, I know we're coming up, coming up on the hour here, but uh, when I was, uh, start, for the last year or so, I've been thinking about this idea about how can the spiritual person uh, affect the world you know I, I, how, how can you do it in a positive way given that in my own way i've been visualizing this uh this uh, juggernaut uh i didn't conceptualize it quite like you have but like um but you know it's what we're dealing with essentially is is what you would call like a, a spectral force an astral force a force that combines the uh the uh imaginal the uh whatever it is all these elemental realms into this Tulpa or egregore, and in a way, you know, um, thinking about it, talking about it, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of doing it in the physical realm. And so for me, I think, and I know you've already, you've already said this is a bad idea, but I think the way to confront it, and, and you know, you, you may disagree with this, is specifically 
specifically with magic, specifically with magical techniques, magical techniques. We're dealing with a, we're dealing with a spiritual force, as you pointed out. I mean, people could have a seance and evoke it, but there's there's various magical techniques one could could use to to fight against it. I wonder if it would be. I get. I mean, it's and it's the kind of thing. I just don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, but like I guess I'm not. Is like you know, like activism. It's too late for activism, right? Basically, it's too late. So, so my my point of view, I guess, is that there's got to be some kind of like spiritual spiritual assault on this, or kind of thing from that aspect. If, if I, listen, I agree like, with you entirely. I agree with you yeah. entirely. But it, that again, it's not mutually exclusive. Um, okay. I, I think you're right that it's late for the kind of activism that Nietzsche would have called rabble rousing. Populist yeah. politics is not the answer right now. Right. That doesn't mean that there aren't political solutions and, and various machinations that are going to be required in order to um, make the program of Prometheism politically relevant, right? Uh, I think that there are people, see, the thing is, our governments are really irrelevant at this point, right? Our civilian elected governments in various nations are really basically irrelevant. The world is run by corporations and by technological uh, networked structures. Yeah. And so that's where the real power is, okay? And so uh, the kind of people that you would need to appeal to to consider a more positive evolutionary trajectory than the one that we're currently headed for are not necessarily people in elected governments, okay? Programmers. Yeah, look, people in the right. high-tech industries that yeah. also are open to you know, the reality of, of, of uh, the spiritual and who don't think in these dualistic terms or in reductively materialistic terms are people who uh, need to be prevailed upon um, in terms of the political program of Prometheism. But I agree with you that uh, this movement, I mean, there's a reason I called it Prometheism. It's Prometheus and theism, right? Prometheism. It is a spiritual revolution that I'm calling for, a spectral revolution. And so indeed, what is in the first case called for here is spiritual warfare. I mean, when I begin the word, the, the uh, Prometheus uh, manifesto and the book Prometheism with the words, this is a declaration of war. I'm talking about a spiritual war, okay? So I agree with you entirely. Now, I think that that needs to be done very carefully, right? But yes, uh, we need cadres of disciplined, focused people who are ready to engage in a spiritual battle. And one thing that has to be kept in mind there and it's a very dangerous lesson to take from history, is that majorities don't make history. Focused, determined minorities with very coherent consciousness are the people who reshape history, okay? I don't wanna go into you know, uh, unnecessarily controversial examples involving you know, certain nations in Europe in the 20th century and so forth, okay? But, uh, a lot of the major political shifts that took place in the world actually had spiritual origins. And they involved small groups of dedicated people who were spiritual warriors that set their minds on a certain transformation of the world. And, and so I agree with you entirely uh, that that's uh, indispensable to this project and it's at the heart um, of our endeavors. Amazing. Hey, uh, we've wrapped up an hour, um, uh, so let's just wrap it up. I just want to tell you that uh, that was a really good, that was just a great conversation. It was really interesting. Your book's awesome. Um, I'm inspired to read your other books, but Prometheus, Prometheus and Atlas is going to keep me busy for a while. It's just, it's so deep. It's unbelievable. Um, but uh, yeah. So thanks, thanks for coming on, Jason. It was it's been really... a pleasure, Scott, and uh, I would be happy to talk to you anytime again. Okay, let me let me come up with another another angle on this. This was good going through those uh, principal characters, but there's a lot of meat in here. So I would love to chat to you again if we can sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Take care, and uh, I will talk to you again soon. Okay, all the best, Jason. Take care. Man. You too. Bye for now, Scott. Bye.